check. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm top of the morning to you too, Roy. Yeah. Happy St. Patrick's Day, and uh, which is a pretty big deal because in my, uh, Heffernan's uh, an Irish name. It goes right back. So, so it wasn't for Patrick going over and uh, being the missionary he did. Who knows where I would be? But uh, <laughs> it is unfortunate that the day turned into a. Oh, it's a lot of drinking and partying for a man who was so faithful to Christ. So, but it's good to be here today to worship the Lord. If you're new, I'm glad you came on out. And uh, uh, we got a little bit of sunshine yesterday, so I was I was praising God for that. And um, I was getting a few feeds on my Facebook from folks down in you know Cuba and wherever they are, these nice sunny places. And I just thought, stop sending me that stuff. Uh, we have a good here in Canada, though. We're we're here together in a nice place and. I will say, uh, friends, it's been quite a week this week, a lot of events taking place. Uh, I know many of you would have uh, known Mim Millet, uh, Mary, who, who passed, went home to be with the Lord, and uh, her service was Wednesday afternoon. Uh, just turned 100 years old. Incredible, incredible. Uh, so we want to express condolences to uh, the family. And we do want to express condolences and sympathy to you, uh, John Icorn. Uh, Pastor John, uh, his wife Femi passed Thursday night. Yeah, so um, together almost 72 years. And uh, she knew the Lord, so absent from the body, present with the Lord in a better place. But we need to be praying for John and the family. Uh, we're with you. You're not alone. was out yesterday praying with John, and, and it's a hard time, as you can imagine. Uh, we are going to have the funeral service here uh, at the church uh, Saturday, April 13th. So some family coming from a few different uh, places. And so April 13th, uh, 2 o'clock, you can mark your calendar for that. Also, I got a call Friday night, and our, uh, our worship leader, Jerry, got sick, uh, got the flu. And uh, I'm going to stop picking up the phone, because every time I hear <laughs> this week was one of those, you know, if I just avoid the phone. So... Uh, He's, he's home getting well, so I, I kind of, I thought, what, Lord, what am I going to do? So first thing Saturday morning, I got on the phone, I called Darcel, and I said, Darcel, help! <laughs> <laughs> and praise God, she's here. Great to have you. <laughs> and I love your outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, she does, yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of adjustments taking place with some different music. And thank you, Justin, for switching the slides around and everything. A big help to have him in the back. Uh, I also had my wife and uh, second daughter away in Ontario for two days. So just me and my son alone in the house. Uh, so it's not as dirty as I thought. They went to check out uh, Univers Redeemer, Redeemer University there for one of the degrees she's looking at, a pre-med degree. So it seemed like it was a positive time. So yeah, they uh, should be coming shortly, I think. Uh, but look, God is good, and uh, we're here today. And I, I wanted to read this passage from Psalm 48, verse 9. It's a simple little sentence. Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. So I would just say, you know, we come here today, different experiences going on in our lives, different things we have happening to us, but in this place, with God's people, the fellowship of His Spirit, the, before Jesus Christ, we want to meditate and reflect on God's unfailing love for you and me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you're, you're with us, that you love us, that you care for us, uh, Lord, that you're a God who died for us, rose again. We want to worship you this morning. Uh, you're the most important person in the room. You're the VIP. Lord, I pray that you would be exalted today. I pray that as we, as we worship you, as we draw near to you, that you would draw near to us. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your presence. Lord, may we sing a joyful noise knowing that we are worshiping the great I Am, the Alpha and the Omega, the resurrection and the life. In Jesus' name we come. Amen. Amen. You can stand together as we sing and worship. Oh, you want to? Yeah, come on over. Sure. 
See, lovely, looks beautiful. <laughs> Stop it. Good morning, Windsor Baptist says again. I wasn't expecting to be here, but I feel blessed. I'm here to worship with you this morning again. We pray for healing for Jerry, uh, that the Lord will place his healing hand upon him, and he'll be back with you next Sunday. But just be blessed. I thought I had picked out some selections that everybody knew, but uh, these guys didn't know a few of them, but they're great. <laughs> they kicked right in. We're all good. And uh, the first two choruses are worship choruses. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. And that's what we've come here for today. And God is so good. And then when we sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. There's the first two verses, everybody sings. And then when it comes to, I have to say this because the men were singing with the women when they shouldn't have been. But <laughs> There's a part where it says men, and that you're going to see sing uh, you and me sister. And then the women will do you and me brother. And then everybody will finish off with the rest. Now I'm going to stop with my noise. But just be blessed, folks. That's what we're here for, to worship and praise God. Amen. sang this one last Sunday, I didn't realize that, so we're going to count our blessings again today. Good, that's right, we have lots of blessings. 
You got it.
be worth your while to come on out and see it if you haven't read the book. But um, at this time, we'll, uh, the children can go if any, with their classes. And I'm just going to pray. I should, can I just pray first, Claire? <laughs> I'm going to take no away. <laughs> that was quick. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the little ones who are here. Um, thank you, Lord, for uh, your presence in our lives uh, and in their lives. And I do pray for their time together. I, I do lift up, Lord, um, the youth in our community, even just talking to somebody before the service, the burden they have uh, to, to see a, a renewal within that generation. As, as we look across West Hans, really, um, ministries in that regard are just aren't there. And so, Lord, we recognize in that sense we need your Holy Spirit. Uh, we need you to do a work uh, in their hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would use our church, our church family, uh, as a vessel to connect, to develop relationships that we might see young lives transformed, uh, futures, future pastors and missionaries and people dedicated to following you. Lord, we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as they scoot off now, I'm just going to adjust the mic. I, I went and um, I asked Myrna, Myrna Stewart, if she'd <laughs> want to come share her testimony this morning. The testimonies are helpful to hear. And she agreed. So you, talking to one of your, your kids, you say you get, tend to get yourself in trouble. So looking forward to hear you dressed in green, too. So you got the, uh, the, the Irish in the blood. Come on up, Myrna. We look forward to hearing... Your walk with the Lord. If you think I'm old, I am. I, 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 I can't get up and down like I used to, but I try. I keep trying. Yes, well, uh, I, I do want to share my testimony with you because I am a follower of Jesus Christ and I love him. So uh, this morning, uh, uh, I want to say, happy St. Patrick's Day to all you good, uh, what will I say, uh, Irish people out there? <laughs> and to all of you who aren't Irish, happy St. Patrick's Day too. Now, this morning, I, I think perhaps I should tell you who I am. I'm so great, but anyway, I am a fisherman's daughter from the foggy, rugged south shore of Nova Scotia, and I love it down there. You couldn't, but, but I can. I don't mind the fog at all. But anyway, uh, I, I grew up there. I was born there and grew up there. Uh, many things in my life the Lord had to bring them together because it seemed so disconnected or whatever. But you know, as a child, I never went to Sunday school. I never went to church. I, I, I didn't know anything about being a Christian. In fact, until I was eight years old, I had never heard the name of Jesus. My parents were good living people, and so were my grandparents. None of them were given to blasphemy, so I, I never heard the name of Jesus. Sounds rather strange, doesn't it? But when I was eight, a uh, um, pastor came to Shake Harbor, Woods Harbor. The Baptist Convention sent him down. They said, well, we don't know much about him. He can't do any harm, and he might do some good. His name was Roland Hill, and when he came, he preached the gospel. And for the first time in my life, I, I heard about Jesus. Did I become a Christian? No, no, that's, that's the sad part of me. I didn't, but I love the stories of Jesus, and he used to tell those stories to us, and he preached the gospel, and there was a great revival down there, and those churches are still serving the Lord. But me, well, Mr. Hill uh, had a passion for children, and he used to have a children's service every Tuesday afternoon. And of course I went. My mother said I had to, so I went. And uh, 
He told us the stories of Jesus. I love them. He told us stories from the Old Testament. I love that. Uh, I went to church, and my grandparents and my mother were three of the first converts to the Lord through his ministry. But uh, as time went on, uh, Mr. Hill moved on to other churches, and other ministers came, and they, they, were, they all preached the gospel. And I sat through many gospel services. I, I have almost a 1,000 gospel services I sat through, I'll tell you, John, <laughs> in my lifetime. But, you know, I, I was still, I still wasn't a Christian. My parent, grandparents became Christians, and my, and my mother... And I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. My grandfather spoiled me terribly. Lloyd would tell you that if he was able to. Uh, and, uh, but my grandmother, she, she understood me. And one day when I was about 12, she witnessed to me. And she said, Myrna, have you asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins? And I said, no. And I and my grandfather said, now, Leah, Myrna's a good girl, you know. And she said, I know, but she's a sinner just the same. And the conversation stopped there. Well, I didn't like my grandmother telling me I was a sinner. I didn't think I was. And, you know, I was the most self-righteous kid, I think, in all of Shelburne County. Uh, I thought, I, I, don't, I don't need a savior. I'm... I'm, I'm not wicked. I'm, I'm good. And I would think I do what my parents say. I don't cheat in school. I try to help people that are uh, at school. If some of them had physical problems, and I would help them at a seat or something. Uh, on and on I went, oh, I had a good list. I didn't think I was a sinner. I was good enough. I, I, that's all I needed. Well, another pastor, when I was about 13, he came, and he believed in having evangelistic services, so he invited this evangelist in from, um, well, well, I'm not sure where he was from, but he came in to, um, to preach to us, and I, he had a week of meetings, that's seven days, isn't it, yeah, so we, I, I went all, th all the days, and I listened, but you know something, on that last day, he began to say, you know, I have come. Jesus came, not just to call the righteous, but the unrighteous. And I thought, well, I'm the righteous one. But he said, you know, I want to share some scriptures with you. And I thought, well, that's okay. So he gave us Jeremiah 17:9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I thought, yes, I know a lot of people that are wicked, you know. <laughs> not me, not me. Um, and, then, and then he went to this scripture, and it was in Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That, that kind of stuck here. I thought, all, does that mean me? And then I thought, oh, maybe not. But then he goes on and he says, all our righteousness are as filthy rags in God's sight. In other words, all the good things you're doing. That's, that's not what God's looking at. And I thought, oh my, I must be a sinner. And at the end of that service, I, 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 I said in my heart, God, please forgive me. At the end of the service, he said, if anyone wants to show their faith, and commitment to Christ. You can come up and we'll talk to you. So I went up. And you know, this is the interesting part. You know who came up at the same? There were others that came. But one other person, my father. And you know, my father was self-righteous too. He, did, he, he was a good, good man. But being good is not good enough. So I came up and they led me to Christ. I confessed my sins. And I became a follower of Jesus. You know, it's, uh, I remember one pastor saying, you know, it's harder to bring good people to the Lord than it is sinners that know they're doing wrong. 
and I guess I'm an example of that. But no matter how good we are, we're not good enough. We need to trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which, which I did. I'm so thankful. And I don't think I told you, but would you believe that my grandmother was, a, was Irish? So I love the Irish. <laughs> and uh, the pastor, who was in Chicago at that time, was an O'Farrell. And I do believe that's Irish. Uh, and you won't believe this, but the pastor that led me to the Lord, the, the evangelist, he was Irish. So I have good Irish connections. But my real connections are with, with Jesus. And, and I do try, I do try to follow him the best I can. Uh, life's not been easy. Becoming a Christian doesn't mean you don't have any problems. Almost think you have more because the devil's really after you. And when I lost my husband in August, it was a blow from which I have not recovered. Oh, I smile and I joke, but when I'm alone, I cry. <laughs> and when my son came, he says, Mom, I can tell you've been crying. I can tell by your voice. But the thing is, Lloyd is with the Lord. I know that. But you know what? I'm not. I'm down here. And it's hard and it's lonely. But Christ does give us strength. I'm so glad that my sins are forgiven, and that uh, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me. Now, I give you this testimony to say that there are people that think they're good enough to go to heaven, just like I did, and just like my father did. And they're hard sometimes to win to the Lord. But we all need, we all need salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for letting me share my testimony. And I, 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 uh, I guess I was reading with Wib last night, and I came to this verse when Jesus is talking to Peter. Now, I am a bit Irish, you know, so you have to expect, you know, you don't know what to expect. And um, Jesus said to Peter, Verily, verily, I say unto you, when you were young. Now, I'm going to say this in plain old English, like that I was brought up with. When you were young, you got yourself dressed and ready, and you went out. You went wherever you wanted to go. But he said, Peter, the day's going to come when you're going to be old. And you're going to have to stretch forth your hands and ask someone to help you. Well, as you know, I've reached that part in my journey. So, Pastor, you're the only one sitting in this front row, so I might need your help to get down. <laughs> God bless you, and, and give you all a real happy St. Patrick's Day. Sunday school. And I took the youngest one, he's about five years old to Sunday school. And he went in and uh, I went in the diamond church and afterwards I picked him up and I got home and I said, Well, Kevin, how can I go? Okay, Grandpa. I said, Well, did you learn anything? And he says, A little bit. I said, Well, what did they talk about? He says, They talked about God's Son. Oh, I said, That's nice. And I said, What did they call him? Well, he said, I said, do you know his son? Do you know his name? Uh, yes, Grandpa, I do. I said, well, then you tell me what his name was. Oh, he says, well, I can't say that, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> Well, they say that everyone is Irish on St. Patrick's Day, and I think that is true. But I never knew I had so much Irish in me until um, one Christmas, Peter and I decided that I could try that Ancestry.com just for a Christmas gift. 
And I thought I was Scottish and French because my father, McKinnon, was Scottish and my mother, LeBlanc, was French. And I found out that I'm 50% Irish. <laughs> so, a tap of the morning to you. I can just picture it in Ireland today. The little leprechauns, they're dancing around. So, here's the reading. Okay. <clears throat> Jesus, okay, John 21, and it's 15 to 19. Jesus reinstates Peter. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you would not, where you do not want to go. This is the reading. Thanks be to God.
We have one more song. We missed, we missed one the first time. Yeah. We only did two. The first set was okay. only you. Okay. Okay. No, no, no. We only did two the first time. Yeah. You kind of it's called the family swirl. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, everybody knows, he's got the whole world in his hands. This is the one that has the... Uh, Verses for the men and the women. Okay? I'm glad somebody knows what's going on. <laughs> it's all good. I will say, the, uh, the way it worked out with uh, Myrna's testimony in the Scripture, that passage from uh, Jesus talking to Peter, when you're older, you'll go where I tell you. Uh, that, that happening twice, I think that's for somebody this morning. We call that double confirmation, so I don't think that was... Uh, that was a fluke, so I don't know if, if that impressed on your heart at all this morning, that's something that you need to listen to and lean into, because uh, it's an important passage for my life as well. I do want to jump in today and uh, go right into uh, near the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the Bible tells us that when Jesus began his ministry, uh, right after his baptism and his temptation, uh, he went a village by the Sea of Galilee called Capernaum, right off the shore, a beautiful place. And uh, the size of uh, the Sea of Galilee, with the air around it, and the, uh, uh, the, level, uh, the sea level of Galilee, uh, makes it a place where there's a lot of fog. So it's interesting you mentioned that, Myrna, you like fog, um, or used to it. And if you watch the show The Chosen, if you've ever seen that, some of those episodes, and Jesus, you see fog around, around the water there. Um, Today, I'm told if you're to go there in person, I've never been there, but I'm told that in Capernaum, you can see the remains of some of the actual homes that are there uh, from the time of Jesus. It'd be like you were walking through those narrow streets. You can almost put yourself in the place of the disciples. When they heard Jesus tell them on the shores of Galilee something very uh, important, and it's these three words, 
uh, come follow me. Come follow me. Again, we heard twice with Peter, and I think God is speaking to some hearts this morning. I want to read this passage uh, from Matthew. And it says here, When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum, which is by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said to the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven has come near. Really important, from the first words out of Jesus' mouth is repent, the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of heaven has come to you. So what's critical, and Myrna ta talked about this, is not just about attending or coming to church. You need to come and know Jesus in a personal way as your Lord and your Savior. That's the ultimate goal for, for those we love and we pray for in our lives. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets, Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Isn't that incredible to just do that? A part of that we'd attribute to the ministry of John the Baptist, who was preparing the way, but they had heard the words of Jesus, uh, what he was starting to do had begun to, to make the, its way around, and these people just followed the Lord. But that's what I'm, I, I want to get into this morning, is just those three words. Very simple, but they're words for all of us. Come and follow me. Come follow me. We are approaching Holy Week in the Christian calendar. That's coming up very soon. And so those words are powerful. They're life-changing. They're, they're mind-altering. They're, um, they're relationally challenging. You, know, you hear those words to Jesus, who do you love? Really, they sum up what happens when you encounter Jesus. All of a sudden, you start to follow him. Your life does a, a 180 like it did for St. Patrick. Talking a bit about them this morning, but he was a follower of Christ, an excellent example of what it means to follow Jesus. And so, you know, we use a lot of words to describe uh, what this whole thing is you are at this morning. Um, we, call it, we call it church, and that makes sense because it means uh, ecclesia, right, in the New Testament, those called out of the world to worship God. We we call ourselves Christians. That makes sense because we believe in Christ as our Lord and Savior, and so we are, are Christians. And as Myrna's testimony uh, testified too, it's not that you're not a Christian just because you attend a church. It's that you've, you believe that Jesus is your Savior who died for your sins. We call it a worship service, right? We have worship service at 10.30 a.m. on Sundays. Makes sense because we're worshiping the living God together. But at its heart, we're a group of people who have chosen to follow Jesus, or we're considering whether or not we want to be a part of that. And that's okay, too. I pray you do. We are Christ followers, people who have decided, as the old hymn goes, to, to follow Jesus. Our lives aren't about us anymore. It's about following Him. So I want to talk a bit about that this morning. And I hope some of you who never decided to follow Jesus and become a Christian will, or even consider in your walk with Him, maybe there's ways you can do that in more of a passionate way. It's not as scary as you might think. And so it isn't about, you know, being raised in a particular denomination or doing Christian things or attendance. It's about surrendering your whole life to Jesus Christ. That's what the church does because that's what the church is, a group of followers. At its heart, 
Jesus' words, come follow me, is an invitation. Uh, I love invitations. We, we get invitations. So you get them on Facebook now. You get wedding invitations. It's, it's an invite to anyone who would come to him and want to follow him. Um, hear me out in a funny way. I don't know if you've heard of the guy that got an invitation to a black tie only event. Black tie only. Uh, he was surprised when he showed up to see everyone wearing pants and shirts, and he wasn't, right? Um, <laughs> poor guy. He, he must have been Irish. Uh, so it's important we understand what we're being invited to, that everyone's being invited to. Don't, we, don't we don't want to get this wrong, right? Jesus calls all of us, invites all of us in the room online to follow him. There's a couple things about this that I want to talk about. Come follow me is God's call on your life to do a few things. And uh, six different things that uh, we'll tap into. Uh, it's a call to learn. To come follow Jesus is a call to learn. Uh, an invitation to learn from the rabbi, a teacher. So when Jesus said, come follow me, he was inviting people to be taught by him as their teacher. Uh, a lovely verse that we've, you've heard and read in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, know the, know the rest part, and learn from me. And learn from me. It's a call to learn. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see, at this time when Jesus is going around in his ministry, there were other groups who wanted followers. Pharisees were one of them, calling people to learn from them. All were competing for disciples. And that word disciple, which can sound like an old word to some generations, but it just meant to be a learner. That's what that word means in the Greek, to be a learner. And what we are doing as Christ followers is we are learning from our teacher who's teaching us. And this gets hard because if you go online or watch social media or television, even certain um, uh, journalists or, or media pundits, we tend to learn and get fed from them. We need to be careful that it's not in opposition to what Jesus is trying to teach us. He's our ultimate teacher. He's the one we want to learn from. He tells us that his yoke was easy and his burden is light because unlike the Pharisees who had all these extra laws above and beyond the Torah, the first five books for Jewish people to follow, it wasn't about regulations but a relationship. A relationship. You have a, a personal relationship, a, a personal student-teacher relationship with Jesus. He's teaching you. And he's not just teaching you stuff. He's teaching you how to live. And this is why it's so important in the church, and we, we keep bumping into certain things as, as, as our society changes, where it's like, no, that's not what Christ taught about how to live. We've got to follow him. And there's some tension there, but we're, we're called to follow him in how we live and, and guide people to follow that narrow way as well. So there's going to be friction, because other people are teaching a lot of different stuff these days. But we, and in this place... We follow Jesus Christ and we learn from Him. And it presumes, by the way, that you're trying to learn. Right? Some students are more astute than others and show up to class. Some don't. Some sleep in a little bit. And, uh, you know, but you've got to show up. You've got to take notes. You've got to apply it to your life. You've got to learn and be intentional about it. And here's something else. Sometimes there's things that you might need to relearn. Even ministers, even those who went to seminary. You know, not everything your parents taught you, even if you were in a Christian home, was right even about church. We want to follow Him. I'm not dismissing your background or anything like that, but you get the premise of what I'm saying. We want to be learners from Jesus. What you learn from friends or what, is pos or what is popular or what you assume to be true might be completely false. 
Sometimes there's things we need to relearn. And as, as you get older, and I'm slowly learning this, there's things I think, okay, I kind of got that a little bit wrong about the Lord. I, I need to grow in that area or mature in that area in my life. Because if we're all honest, when it comes to life, your future, the world, events, eternity, do we even know anything in any concrete way outside of the teachings of Jesus Christ that we can depend our life on? Who really knows anything? He's a reliable source of truth. He's, he's a realist. He tells us what reality is as God has made it. And the situation we find ourselves in. We are sinners who need a savior. It's a call to surrender. <clears throat> I'm the independent kid in the family. I like to do my own thing. I really like to do my own thing. I think that's why Peter's uh, conversation with Jesus at breakfast that morning is something God's used in my life. It's like, yeah, I know you like to be that kind of person, but guess what? I'm going to put it to you politely, Rob, but I made you and I saved you, but uh, I'm the boss now. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the boss now. Yeah, I, you know, uh, and I know he calls us friend, but he is, he is our Lord. And it's a call to surrender to him. He knows he's already, you know, Lord of heaven and earth. The point is, will you choose? Will you choose to recognize it and obey it? Just because someone doesn't believe in God doesn't mean he doesn't exist. He's very much alive. And all we have is because of him. Uh, he gives us access to everything. If it wasn't for Jesus, we'd have not. Several years back, I was down at um, uh, CFB Halifax, down the, the naval base down the city for something I was doing down there. And you know what? Uh, nobody just drives into that place. <laughs> you don't just show up and say, I'm coming in here now. Uh, I, I met up with a chaplain. He, kinda, he showed me around. A guy I know down there. It was a pretty cool experience. But something that I would not have been allowed to do myself. I only had access to that premises and certain places within the premises because I was with him. We only have access to heaven, the salvation of sins, forgiveness of sins, eternity, because we know Jesus Christ outside of him. So he, he owns everything. Come follow me. Jesus is claiming special authority over you and really over all things. He knows the way, he is the way, and calling you to live in that way. You see this authority displayed on every page of the New Testament. I mean, he commands the storm to be calmed, and it, it immediately obeyed him. He commanded the demons to come out of the people, they came out. In John's gospel, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one has the right to talk like that, to claim that they are the I am, except for a person with spiritual authority, God himself. Someone who can satisfy the deepest hunger and thirst of a human soul. And so following Jesus isn't just liking Jesus or liking certain things that he says, but not other things. It's, he's the Lord of my life and I'll surrender to what he tells me to do. And one of the things I noticed in the last week or two, just talking to some very faithful Christians and, and people that God likes to use in certain ways, they all have a similar uh, disposition in their heart. And, and what I'm picking up on is, it, regardless of where you're from or, or who you are or what gender you are or, or your language or your background and so on, God loves to use people who just say, here I am, send me. He uses those kinds of people in powerful ways. It's the Pharisees who were stiff-necked. He couldn't get through to it. Stiff-necked is an image of a, uh, of a dog. Ever try to push a dog's neck down? And they, they, they go like that. And it's kind of a, <laughs> come on, Jack. Uh, he'll use people that just, that just walk with him, surrender. And he'll use them in power. People that you wouldn't, you might even write off, he will use in powerful ways. He loves these people who just surrender to, to him. Now, 
Another part of this, come follow me, and you see it from the, the first uh, disciples, uh, apostles really, is to leave something. This gets hard. But the freedom in Christ is you can let go of things that are holding you back. It's a call to leave something behind, the things that are holding you back behind to a whole new chapter of life. He called Simon, Peter, and Andrew to abandon their nets. He made James and John leave their boat and their father. That's family. Right? That's occupation. That's career. Now, this is big stuff. It was a wonderful testimony yesterday, if, if I can, uh, Reverend Icorn, but to hear your testimony and you and Femi of selling the farm and getting into ministry. Boy, that's a, <laughs> it's inspiring. That's what people do because they hear the call of God in their life and they leave something behind to do that new thing that he's calling them to do. Matthew, the tax collector, walked away from his table crowded with money and tax records. He just stood up and left it all behind. I mean, there was a lot of money in being a tax collector. When Jesus called these men, they left friends, family, and even their occupations. The call affected their time, their finances, and everything. So the call of Jesus is never just a call to believe in some you know, different facts about him. It's, it's always a call to follow him. And following Jesus always involves leaving something behind. That's why he says, pick up your cross daily, to deny yourself, right? that part of you. It's making choices. It's choosing this and not that. It's leaving one thing to focus on the other. In Matthew 19, we read how one young man heard that call, but his money was holding him back. His money. Nothing wrong with having some money, but his money was poisoning his soul. So Jesus' interaction with this young man, of all the things he could talk about, what would you talk about with a young, a young man? He says, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. There's that same line, come follow me. You've got to leave the, leave the money behind. That part can get hard. I've seen people wrestle with money and career, even, even um, religions. That's a big one in the world today. Denominations can be a big one too. We've got some in our land that have really gone right off, and it's like, are they following the Lord? Can I still stay with that? Maybe you shouldn't. It's not an attack on your family. It's just... Just like the first disciples, they're, just, they're called to follow the Lord. Right? A call to be led. We've been talking about this. To be led by Him. Literally, though, the, you know, the first disciples physically followed Him wherever they went. Wherever He went, sorry. And when Jesus said, let's go to that village over there, they, they did go to that village over there. You know? Discipleship was very personal and physical. I mean, things are different today. Um, I often say I'd like to see my, my boss face to face. Sometimes, you know, it'd be hard to wrestle with him, but he gives us his Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is in us, so we, we, we follow him and are led by him. And, and uh, for some people, that means moving geographically to different places and different spaces. The Spirit of Christ in us Paul writes, those who are the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. A significant verse. They walk in step with the Spirit of God as He empowers and equips and enables us as Christians to do various things in various places. And when we do, we experience God's providence, His provision, His protection, Traveling through the countryside, Jesus and his disciples had little money, but God met their needs. Jesus said, therefore, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the, the Gentiles seek after 
these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. When we do God's will, we should expect God to provide for our essential needs. It's a trust walk with him. And the last one, oh boy, five, not six. I'm off this morning, but we're all, <laughs> it's all good. Like I said, it's been a week. It's all good. Not six, it's five. So if you were falling asleep, we just got excited. So, And this, this kind of this goes throughout, and it's what will happen because I think this is what God is really after. It's a call to be changed. You're, you're not going to be the same when you follow him. You know, to learn from him, to surrender from him, to leave things behind, to be led by him. You're not going to be the same. And that's not a bad thing. It's an invitation for change, for him to change us. Because that's really what we need. He's, he's all about redemption and transformation. And I think for some people, deep down, this is why they don't want to do it. This is why they don't want to do it. They don't want to change. As we follow Jesus, he changes us from the inside out. And it's liberating. But some people think it isn't. Jesus told Simon and Andrew, I will make you fishers of men. I mean, they were, they were about, about to embark on a whole new adventure in life. I don't know if you've ever seen The, the Hobbit, the movie, the Bilbo Baggins who initially didn't want to go on the journey because he liked his life in the Shire the way it was. And then he said, well, whatever, and he goes off and has just an adventure of a lifetime. And when he came back, he was a different person. And that's not a bad thing. Every now and again, I go back home. I, it's hard to say that now because home has changed. It's, it's the still, same as still a physical spot in Moncton, New Brunswick, but I go back and I'm different. I think I don't know if I can go back because <laughs> it's not the same because I've changed. Everything's different, and it's not a bad thing. I mean, for, the, for the, uh, the disciples, it was to fish for people instead of protein, a radical change. And we tend to get pretty comfortable where we're at. For a number of us, it doesn't matter what age and stage you're at, but for a number of us, God is calling us to, to sell our homes and, and move to the crossing or move to the Manning or, or, or go to Dykeland. These are big steps of faith. Some of you have moved from somewhere else in Canada and came, came to Nova Scotia, and here you are. It's a change of life, and we know we will never be the same when we do, but I think that God is with us through the whole journey. It's a step of faith something not to be scared of, and to be open to the new thing he has for you, whatever that is. Now, it's true, only certain people could hear Jesus' call to be transformed. This was for everyone as he was going around. Uh, those who trusted in their own righteousness couldn't hear it. Only those who felt a sickness in their souls. And by the way, if you think Vern and I line this up. We didn't. This is all a God thing. And I'm convinced God is speaking to some people here this morning. That's why Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. And we all are. But some think they're not. Being changed is nothing to be scared of because you're spiritually sick. And the only way to get better is to follow him. Uh, one author put it like this, the brokenness of our lives becomes the growing edge of our souls. The brokenness of our lives becomes the growing edge of our souls. It's in those places of brokenness where God loves to work and does some of his coolest stuff. You see, the invitation here to come follow Jesus is for everyone who doesn't have life all figured out, which is why it was the fishermen and the outcasts and the prostitutes who were following Jesus, not the religious elite, because they knew they needed someone to help them. You know, so I'll put it to you as simply as I can. If your life is a wreck, 
welcome to the family of God, because none of us have this thing figured out. As we approach, uh, approach Holy Week, friends, uh, and, and reflect on those words, come follow me, may we be willing to be taught and to recognize his authority. May we forsake whatever hinders our walk with him, that he might give us the courage to leave those things behind. And may we be open to his leading and allow him to change us. It's just like the old hymn said, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let's pray. It really is that simple to just trust and obey you, Lord. To, I pray that people would hear your invite, your invite to come follow you. For those of us who have, I pray we'd continue to do that. Maybe we've reached a point where we're wrestling with whether we want to. We, and it's not popular to do it anymore. So I pray, Lord, that in and through all that, you would purify our hearts that, that our following you would be out of a love for you. Not to look good, not to earn salvation, which we can't and never could, but just because we love you because you first loved us. Lord, you're the boss. We surrender ourselves to you this church family to you. You're the one whom all authority has been given to in heaven and on earth. I pray, God, that you would have your way with us and that we would experience the true freedom to be led wholly by the Spirit of God, your Spirit who lives in us, to the glory of God the Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, thank you to the worship team. Thank you to Arcel. Real humdinger there. That was good. <laughs> Amen. I do love the words of that hymn, though. It's a question we all have to ask every day, every week, every month. Will we do that, which he is asking us to do? As we look through the week, there's a, a number of events up there. I'm just going to highlight this week. We do have a finance meeting Tuesday night at 6.30 and the family movie night uh, this Saturday at 6.30. Uh, you'll notice the events for Holy Week uh, next week, and we also have a handout for you there if you want to pick up and put on your fridge. So let's pray. God, you are awesome. I mean, you're amazing. You love us. You've done so much for us. In one way, it's such a great cost to give up everything to follow you, but in another, it's it's the least we could do. You made us for yourself. I pray that we would capture a, a greater vision of you, a deeper passion for you. Lord, we recognize that you are the Lord of heaven and earth. Who are we to complain? Who are we to question? Who are we to be a skeptic of any word You've written in your scripture. Thank you, Lord, for loving us enough that you would so reveal yourself to us, that you would take on flesh and come to earth, that you would die for our sins, that we might have forgiveness from them, that you would indeed save us. I pray that all sinners who know they are would come and experience a life-changing grace that you offer in Jesus Christ through faith. In your name we pray, amen.